I am pleased to be able to tell you something of my journey into science and faith, where I look at powerful signs of the Passion of Christ that have occurred in our world today. What has happened will possibly present one of the greatest challenges to science ever. What you're about to see, I'm sure you will find truly fascinating. For over 25 years, I have been examining some very remarkable cases and they appear to be supernatural. The scientific findings are outstanding. Those findings I have now published in a new book, My Human Heart, Where Science and Faith Collide. In the book I present compelling evidence from cases that I have examined where God has powerfully intervened in our world and suspended the laws of nature. And he has permitted both science and the camera to witness it. In doing so, he has shed light on some of the greatest mysteries that have ever confronted mankind. In the book I tell of how in 1995, a person bought a statue of Christ that looked like this. But on the very day that it was purchased, it began to shed tears and blood all of its own accord. It's hard to imagine how such a thing could happen, but I saw it happen myself. I was able to film this moment when it shed tears. I've interviewed many witnesses who also saw it shed blood. X-rays showed that the statue had not been tampered with. For over two decades, I have engaged scientists throughout the world to do pathology and DNA tests on blood produced by the statue. They found that the blood was from a living human being. But that blood did not have a human genetic code. Professor Fiori, a professor of legal medicine in Rome, was to again confirm it with testing on two further samples I gave him. He reported to me that the blood was of human origin. But strangely, it did not have a human genetic code. For this unusual result, he had no explanation. And so the question, why did this person not have a human genetic code? Pathology testing on blood scabs gave even more surprises. Under the scabs, there was epithelial tissue, skin. Tissue which is produced by a living person in the healing process to stop bleeding when the body has been severely wounded. I think we can just start with a close-up. And what you see here, this is a low power, and this this is all dried, dissolved blood cells. And then here are ghost-like outlines of cells. You can see the nuclei barely in here. So this is epidermis. This is this skin. This huh? is skin. Skin and blood on the surface. Skin, which is degenerated also, and blood on the surface. On further examination, a histopathologist found that mixed with the blood were tiny pieces of traumatized skin tissue, which you can see here at the bottom of the screen. It's stratified epithelium, it's probably squamous, but it's actually quite, quite nice and preserved. He said it was delicate tissue, possibly from the skin of the mouth, or the inner parts of the lip. Or it could have come from deeper skin like the face where the keratin layer had been stripped off. He said it was not normal to find tissue in blood. The fact that the tissue was mixed with the blood indicated that there had been traumatic injury, as you would find if a person had been beaten with a blunt object that caused bleeding. 
When he told me this, he knew nothing of the history of the sample. That this material would not come from an inanimate object. Science cannot explain how this statue of Christ has taken on by itself the attributes of a living, suffering and wounded human being. The town of Assisi in Italy is famous because it is where St. Francis lived and died in the 13th century. He was known to have had the stigmata of Christ and other mystical experiences. Some years ago, I filmed a person kneeling at his tomb. From her hands, I could see emerging a perfumed oil. These same hands were to become a focus of other mystical experiences I witnessed and recorded. Her name is Katia Rivas from Bolivia. With no theological training, she has now written 80 books of profound theology without error. She says that they are dictated to her by Christ himself. I have filmed her many times when this has been happening. The books explain the Bible and the language of man of today. They tell of the love of God for mankind, the purpose of life, the reality of heaven, the only way that this world will find peace, and much more. We believe that, that it is the Lord himself who, who is speaking, speaking to her. It would be difficult for someone that does not have theological training to be able to uh, memorize or, or to express uh, these uh, theological truths uh, with the simplicity and the directness which uh, are evident in the writings. But also, the writings explain why each of the extraordinary events that I present in the book are happening. Katya also experiences the stigmata, the wounds inflicted on Christ during his crucifixion. When I told investigative journalist Mike Willisie about it, he was sceptical. He wanted to see it for himself and to film it if it happened again. Katya predicted on film the day and time when she would next have the stigmata, two months away. She said that Jesus told her the day it would happen again and that we could film it for all to see. So, Katya, from that message, you completely believe that the day after that Corpus Christi feast day, you will have the stigma. That will give us a lot to think about. Eso nos daría muchísimo para pensar. Mí también. And also for me, yes. Gracias. Thank you very much. To our surprise, it did happen exactly as she predicted. We filmed the whole event. Welcome to Fox Studios in Los Angeles. What an honor it is to work alongside you. Thanks, Giselle. I understand from all the noteworthy work that you've done over the years where you're renowned for your skepticism and investigative abilities, this is not only different, this project we're about to see has been extraordinary for you. It started seven years ago for me through a lawyer who started this investigation and I simply did not believe most of what he told me. A lot of things have happened since then. It's been an extraordinary journey and I'd like our viewers to join us on that journey. It formed part of a Fox Network special program, Signs from God, that was broadcast to 29 million viewers in the United States alone. Everyone was able to see how from nothing, deep bleeding wounds progressively formed, as if she had been nailed through her hands and her feet, like in the crucifixion of Christ. She suffered pain. At 3 p.m. the wounds began to heal. By the next morning they had completely healed, contrary to medical opinion. Now, I don't believe any microsurgeon in the world could heal those wounds so smoothly in less than 24 hours. In the back of this hand, 
This is just after 24 hours later from the start of the day. Nothing that you can see. This hand, two crosses. On the palms, nothing. Hmm. What do you say when you see something like that, mate? Just the same. Well, it's medically that's impossible. From what we saw yesterday, it is quite impossible for those wounds to heal like that. And if you look at the feet also, Ron, you can see where I was taking blood yesterday. And also you notice if you look closely that the wounds have healed in a most unusual manner. They draw in. It's almost like something in internally draws it all together from the inside. And summing up yesterday, what would you say? God was present. It was amazing. Miracle. Do you dip? I did not have. <laughs> in the book, I next turn to another supernatural sign, Eucharistic miracles. In Escorial in Spain, there exists one of many communion hosts that have been known to have bled through history. King Philip II in the 16th century gave his royal protection and honour to a communion house that had been desecrated by a soldier who viciously stamped on it with his spiked boots. It immediately began to bleed. For the king, a sign. The blood of Christ had shed again through violent injury inflicted on him by man. The relic has become a national treasure. It happened here in Lanciano in Italy in the 8th century. A communion host transformed during Mass to what looked like flesh and blood. When a scientist examined it in 1971, it was found to be human heart tissue. It has also happened in Orvieto in Italy. Each year, the people of Orvieto come together in grand celebration to remember what happened here back in the 13th century. During Mass, a priest who had doubts found that the communion host bled in his hands and onto the altar cloth. The reigning Pope, Urban IV, was so impressed by this miracle that he instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Body and Blood of Christ. The feast is now adopted by the Universal Church. The original blood-stained altar cloth is today proudly carried in procession through the streets. As I filmed it all, I could see the immense faith people had. That faith was not based on any scientific testing. I wondered what modern-day science would reveal if a claimed Eucharistic miracle could be tested. Fortunately, I was given the chance to find out. I'm going to do it all. It was here, in Buenos Aires, that something most extraordinary happened. Pope Francis, then the Archbishop of the city, wanted it investigated and I was privileged to have carried out that investigation. It revealed far more than I ever expected. It is that story which is the centrepiece of my book. It has now become universally known as the Eucharistic Miracle of Buenos Aires. It happened in this church. The story centered around this priest Padre Alexandro Pizet, who said that on the 18th of August in 1996, a communion host was found abandoned in his church. The host was put into a bowl of water and then locked in the tabernacle. Eight days later, when the tabernacle was opened, a blood-like substance was noticed coming from the host. In the following week, the transformation continued. In October of 1999, samples were taken and then the investigation began. 
In 2004, I presented a sample to New York forensic pathologist Dr. Frederick Zuckerby. He was told nothing of its origin. He had no trouble identifying the substance. Heart tissue. Uh, there's a inflammatory infiltrate here. The heart tissue itself is degenerating, is degenerative. In other words, this is what happens sometimes after a, a, a heart attack. This is a person that had a heart attack, but not it's not a immediate. In other words, the person had to have lived a period of time after this. Now, there's other things that can cause this type of a item that resembles a heart attack. In automobile accidents, uh, where they get uh, chest crushes and it causes a, a damage uh, to the heart. You get it from pe a person getting beat up across the chest. You get, uh, you get coronary uh, injuries from that. You get coronary injuries from people who gave CPR incorrectly and a person comes out of it. That area may uh, 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 die off. The injury hit this area of the heart right here. The heart is one area that I know. Yes. This is my business. I think it, I think it actually comes from about uh, about right in this area, right in here. And what's the function of that part of the heart? That's the left ventricle. That's a major uh, area that pumps the blood to all parts of the body. Now, what's the history? Okay. We're investigating the potential of this being a Eucharistic miracle. A communion host was found abandoned in a church in Argentina in 1996. Somebody picked it up and instead of the priest consuming it because it had been on the floor and was dirty, they placed it in water. It was put in the tabernacle. When it was taken out a few days later, it was a blood-like substance. Then when the blood-like substance appeared, they thought something is happening here, so they put it all into distilled water. That is amazing. How long had it been in the water and all? Three years. That tissue was in water for three years? Yes. That's hard to believe because the tissue in here shows good fixation. And it would be amazing. The big thing about it is, that's really so funny, here it's heart muscle. But those cells are not normally there. Those inflammatory cells are not normally there. They come in as a reaction to injury. The blood supply is compromised and so forth. That's what really amazes me, that if that was a piece of Eucharist, where did those cells come from? These cells have to come from other areas of the body in order to do that. You guys are kind of uh, like detectives on this stuff, huh? It's, I think it's the world's biggest detective story. Uh huh. Indeed, the biggest detective story in the world. As a lawyer, I had engaged Dr. Zugabi to examine the Buenos Aires sample I gave him. There was just journalist Mike Willisey and myself in the room. It was then I filmed Dr. Zugabi tell, for the first and only time ever, his most astonishing findings. It was an historic moment. What I recorded him say has already reverberated around the world, and it will continue to do so forever. The telltale signs of injury were the presence of living white blood cells. Forensic pathologist Dr. Robert Lawrence commented on the presence of those cells. If this material had been placed directly into water after it was taken off a body, I would expect these cells to be dissolved. So uh, they, were, they were active, living white cells at the time they were collected. The spontaneous coming into existence from nothing of those living white blood cells is astonishing. Cells are the basic units of life. They are evidence of life. 
The cell is the most complex and mystifying item ever encountered in the study of biology. Each tiny cell has been likened to a functioning city, and yet all those you see on this screen could fit on the tip of a pin. It takes this university student textbook of over 1,000 pages to attempt to explain the cell. Something of the complexity of the cell is seen in this chart of its biochemical pathways. The cell has been likened to a tiny factory with thousands of beautifully designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery, far more complicated than any machinery built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The rules of biology say that cells can only ever come from other existing cells. But the question remains, where did the first cell come from? And how did it get to be so complex and contain such obvious evidence of magnificent design, engineering, logic and purpose? Science tells us that what you see here was not designed at all because the forces of nature can and did self-assemble that first cell over billions of years. This is a theory based on assumptions and not on facts. But the facts in the Buenos Aires case tell us something very different. This snapshot of what was seen under the microscope is direct evidence of human cells and human life having come into existence from non-living matter spontaneously and not over billions of years. Here we clearly see the living white blood cells that Dr. Zuckerby spoke about. And then, on the right, the human heart muscle tissue itself, all from a living person. For over 100 years, scientists have been experimenting and searching for how life began, and they still don't know. They have been looking for one instance of where a cell of life has emerged from non-living matter, and they have not found one. Scientists can now end their 100-year search. In the Buenos Aires case, they will find what they have been looking for. And the same with the human heart tissue. This tissue is from one of the most complex organs of the human body. And it came into existence spontaneously, without evolution and without ancestry. But science tells us with insistence that the human heart only exists today because it's self-assembled through a Darwinian evolutionary process over billions of years from a series of lesser forms of species. Darwin himself said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. On his own test, Darwin's theory has now absolutely broken down. The Buenos Aires case puts God finally back into the creation story. What happened in Buenos Aires in 1996 has since happened elsewhere. It happened in Tixla in Mexico in 2006. A communion host bled during distribution of communion. It was found to be human blood and human heart tissue. And again in Sokolka in Poland in 2008. A communion host was dropped by a priest at communion time. When put in water, a blood-like substance emerged. The substance was found to be human heart tissue from a living person who had suffered trauma. And also in Legnica, Poland, in 2013. A communion host also transformed. It was found to be fragmented cardiac tissue from a heart that suffered severe trauma. In all these cases, the finding was that a communion host had turned to heart tissue and from a heart that had suffered traumatic injury. 
No book of science can explain how or why bread could change to flesh in all these cases. There is, however, a book, the Bible, written 2,000 years ago, which records Jesus talking about bread and wine turning to his flesh and blood. But there is a lot more to this story that I tell in the book, and it is truly fascinating. The blood from the statue showed no human genetic code with standard DNA testing. This same very unusual phenomenon was found with the Buenos Aires communion host. No human genetic code was found there either. This code requires a father. So why was there not one in both cases? But in 2016, in Bologna, Italy, a forensic laboratory did advanced DNA testing on our cases to determine the genetics of the mother's ancestry. They used the latest forensic testing technology. They found similarities which pointed to the statue case and the communion host case as both having the same code of maternal ancestry. These results are of immense significance. Their words, we got unprecedented results in the history of forensic DNA testing. And the cases were somehow related. So in both cases, we're talking about a unique person, someone who suffered traumatic injuries, someone who had no human genetic code but someone who did have identifiable genetic maternal ancestry, the mother's code. Could this person be Jesus Christ, said to be born of a virgin? The one who was crucified 2,000 years ago and whose image mysteriously appears on what is believed to be his blood-stained burial cloth found in his empty tomb, the Shroud of Turin. When photography was invented, the shroud was photographed. The photographic negative was to reveal this positive image of the person. No one has an explanation for this. But on this cloth there is blood. There it is also in the region of the heart. The blood is there, they say, because the cloth came in contact with the crucified body of Jesus. It is believed to be the blood of Jesus Christ. At a conference in France in 1997, the blood on the shroud was addressed by Dr. Alan Adler. I filmed him. The other thing we concluded was that the blood images on this cloth were in fact put on the cloth by this cloth coming in contact with a man who was wounded and who died a traumatic death. You're looking at the exudate of clotted wounds, and furthermore, there are some very peculiar features to the chemistry of these wounds and the composition. They contain an abnormally large amount of bilirubin. There's a very simple explanation of that. You're looking at a man who died a severely traumatic death prior to the shedding of this blood. In other words, he was in traumatic shock, the kind of thing you get if you were beaten, and then, in fact, crucified. Under those conditions, you get an enormous so-called ictric index of the bilirubin to the hemoglobin into the blood, which, when it forms the clot, will be in the exudate from the clot, it will make the kinds of wounds we see, in particular, the red color. My ambition is to have this blood forensically analysed, then to compare the results with those we obtained in genetic testing of the heart of the Buenos Aires Communion host case. The blood on the shroud is from a dead man who died 2,000 years ago. The heart in the Communion host was found to be from a living person of today. If there was a match and the heart was found to be from the same person, Think of the consequences. The person who was once dead is now alive. It would be science that tells us that.
The facade of St. Peter's at the Vatican expresses in stone how Christ is central to Catholic belief. This place has been home to the leader of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years starting from St. Peter and then each successive Pope. It is the spiritual home to some 1.2 billion Catholics around the world. Their leaders from the beginning have encouraged all that they should accept in faith alone the Church's essential teaching. That Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead and that he is truly present in the communion host. But today those beliefs have become very much questioned. Only 30% of Catholics in the United States believe church teaching that Jesus is truly present in the communion host. Most Catholics don't believe. Central to Catholicism is the claim that Jesus is really, truly and substantially present. Okay, that to me should be a commonplace. Affirmed throughout the tradition, affirmed up to the catechism of, you know, 1993, central to the Catholic faith. 75% of our own people don't believe it. Um, as I've been saying for a long time, it represents a massive failure, and I include myself in this, we're, we're all guilty, a massive failure on the part of Catholic educators and catechists, evangelists, teachers. Um, I don't know any way to say it nicely, but if on this central matter of our belief and practice, there's this much deep misunderstanding, something has gone uh, substantially wrong. So I think this should be a, a bit of a wake-up call and should be a, you know, a call to action on, on the part of, of everybody in the church. Now, for the first time in human history, there is a chance for those essential teachings of the Catholic Church to be confirmed by science. For this to happen, the cooperation is required from the one who stands in the shoes of St. Peter, here in the Vatican the one who started my whole investigation, Pope Francis. I have written to Pope Francis seeking his permission for further testing on the Shroud as the next logical step in the ongoing investigation of the Buenos Aires case. My letter sits on his desk in this building. My letter and my book set out for Pope Francis the case as to why the testing should be done and the potential benefits to mankind. That testing could provide answers to the world's most important questions. Is Jesus Christ, God eternal, our creator, with no human genetic code? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? And is it his human heart, the heart of Jesus Christ, that we found present in the communion host of Buenos Aires? It is now in the hands of Pope Francis, or a future Pope, for all this to happen. The stories that I have told both here and in my book are certainly unusual, but they are all related. They combine to give us confidence to expect that the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires will prove to be one of the most significant events to have happened in the history of Christianity. Not only will it have an immense impact on science and on religion, but it will also mean that the first chapter in the history of humanity, that chapter that deals with the origin of man, will now need to be rethought and rewritten. Mm -hmm.